this year you are celebrating Nemo Dunami's 30th year. Oh yeah. Uh, when you look back, uh, what do you think has contributed to, to contributed to the band's growth and productivity? Innocence. I think we're still we're still kind of innocent uh, in a way. From your earlier interviews, I've uh, I read that you defined your band as romantics. Yeah. Would it be? A fair yeah, I think that's definitely I think that's definitely true. We are, we started. Yeah, we're romantics. I think I think we believed in this that it was all for something. And it and it was in, it was kind of felt important, and it's not. We never felt the need, especially in modern times. We don't feel the need to define what it's for, but it's just a feeling that it's that it's for something. And you still believe that? Yeah. And yes. It doesn't. It hasn't actually. Yes, I know lots of musicians that after after a number of years in the business they become very cynical because the business makes you cynical. Um, but we sort of don't really notice the business. <laughs> we have, there seems to be enough money to keep going. None of us are really interested in money. Um, so, um, we're, kind of, we're still innocent about it. And I think uh, this led you to uh, form your own label. Yeah, I think it, we, we, we had some years on major labels. Like EMI. Uh, EMI for quite a long time, and then Sony, Sony for one album. And we had an okay relationship with EMI actually. Somebody from EMI sometimes would come to see us and say, Look, you need to do this and this to sell more records. And we'd say, Fuck off, go back to London. So they'd go back to London and we'd go on doing what we do. And they, they tolerated us. We were their kind of weird, weird sort of pet band that. They left alone because we, we wouldn't do anything that they told us, and we had this fantastic contract with them where they couldn't tell us what to do. Um, and so we just did what we did, and we sold quite a lot of records for them in the end. But sadly, now our relationship with EMI is, yeah, is terrible. But that's because EMI is not actually a record company; it's just a kind of accountancy thing. Now, yeah. but once upon a, you know, at the time we were there, we were okay there. But the problem with a the problem with a major label is that you are if you sign to EMI in or Sony or someone in London because they want you, you're automatically on EMI in Paris and Istanbul and New York and Japan and everywhere, whether they want you or not. And that was a problem for us where we had a really good relationship with EMI in England and Germany and some other countries. We had a ter we had no relationship with EMI in France and. America and, and other and places. Perhaps they didn't get your music. Yeah, they didn't understand it. They didn't understand the band and our non-commercial attitude and all these kind of things. So, it, so the two things happened. One is that we we decided this was a kind of problem and that we would be better being an independent and working with different people around the world that loved the band and understood us. And the other thing was that we under we sort of realised that the internet was going to change everything. It was going to smash the old system, well, which it has. Uh, I was going to ask you this later, but uh, what do you think about current modes of production of music? Uh, for example, uh, both about uh, I'd like to ask both about the digital music, the electronic music, and also the uh, current problems with distributing uh, CDs uh, or selling CDs. Yeah. In fact, okay. So the the old model of selling CDs and stuff is kind of finished. And people go to torrent sites and they steal the latest New Model Army album. And I think. It, and how do you feel about And I think it probably is stealing, but I don't really care. It's just part of the modern world. Do I like it? Not really. Do I worry about it when I go to sleep? No. It's like, it's just how it is. The interesting thing we, you said about modes of production, though. One thing that's been on my mind is that how the quality of music like the quality of a lot of things in the world, a lot of things in the world get cheaper and easier to get, and easier to make. The music's the same. It's cheaper and easier to make. Everybody makes it on bloody laptops, including us. 
We recently did a, a we're doing a 30 year an anthology. Yes. And we put 30 tracks together for this from the different eras of the band. Uh, it's an interesting exercise because there's 200 songs and you know, we had to choose 30. We, we, in the end, we asked each member of the band, past and present, and close friends. Yeah, um, to choose their own favourites. Uh, and as we listened, and then I decided that it would be very boring to put it in chronological order. So we just went, <laughs> fixed it up. What's, it, what's an interesting order from a kind of a journey, an emotional journey, not a, not a time journey, but an emotional journey. And the interesting thing is not the difference between the different musicians in the band or the different stages of our development or the different musical influences. The, diff the big difference is tape to digital recording. Sometime around the late 90s, we started, like everybody else, we started using computers to record. And it sounds like shit, by comparison. Tape just sounds better. So you like the analog sound? Absolutely. But now, tape is just so expensive that it's not. But I heard that you made your own experiments with... The we did vinyl, but we didn't record with tape. Recording on old two-inch tape like records were made until the mid-90s um, is now unbelievably expensive. You know, you're not sure if you're Amy Winehouse, you, might, you maybe you can do it. But if you're Niwad Lamy or most bands, you just can't afford it really. Um, and there's tape studios, are very few now. And this is it's an interesting thing, it's a little bit like um, animation. Once upon a time, um, animation films were either painted Every, yes. sh every shot was painted. Yes. The, or the animation, the cell animation as we know it, is dead now. Yeah, now that, that, or, or, or modelling, you know, like Wallace and Gromit, do you have that here? Did you? Um, you know, plasticine models where they take a photograph and then they move it and then they take a photograph. Stop motion. Yeah. Um, these look fantastic. And they, then they... they and organic. And then, yes, and organic. And then they, ch they copy it into a computer and they do the computer version. It looks two-dimensional, because it's two-dimensional. And the same with music. And I worry that music... Somebody said, is the internet going to kill music? And what they meant is because of CD sales and, and stuff. And that doesn't matter. That doesn't make any difference. The thing that, the thing that makes music... Will, sort of kills music is when there's too much music and it's too easy, and it's too cheap, and it's too two-dimensional. I see. And uh, what really amazed me about your last record, uh, Today is a Good Day, is that uh, I heard that you shied away from click tracks. Yeah, yeah, no click tracks. Except for Northern Star. Yeah. Uh, I think it was Max Roach who said that uh, music should breathe. Yeah. And um, I think Today is a Good Day, the song itself, it's at, at certain times breathing through its nostrils. And I feel that. I feel the energy. I feel the dynamics. Do you think that uh, the ener energy and the dynamics of the uh, 2009 album, uh, Today is a Good Day, improved with the lack of click track? I think it helped. I think that the current band is the best version of New Model Army ever, if not, or, or since 1985, maybe. Because since Marshall joined us, we're kind of balanced. You know, in balance there's always politics between people. There is, there's factions. You know, it's inevitable. Um, but with this five, with New Milan, there isn't, really. We, we mostly a happy band, and we mostly trust each other. And if you trust each other, then you just allow each other to play. Kind of. And so it was a kind of very fast program. We made the whole album in 12 days. And it was just recorded all pretty live. I see, and I think uh, since 2005, you are making albums uh, once in two years. Uh, so, can we accept? Uh, can we expect another album in 2011? Uh, I mean, uh, the production of a new album. Uh, I hope so. Yeah, I think so. I th this year's been 
very kind of full on with the with the today's good day tour, which kind of six months, pretty much straight on the road, six months, and then uh, and then now the anniversary stuff. And I have had very little chance to write. And suddenly, without a manager, we, you know, we had Tommy T, who's our manager, and ran our record company. And, uh, he died. He passed away in, at the end of 2008. And since when we've been trying to manage ourselves, which is kind of difficult, actually. Yeah, and what changed uh, with his uh, passing? The, the organisation. Don't have any. We're, band, we're we're musicians managing ourselves. This should never happen. We're hopeless at it. But we tried to find. We we've got help from people, but there's no one because we operate like a family. And we you need also a kind of call and family. your fans call each other yeah. the family. It's a kind of a bit of a there's this kind of network. So it's we you know, we I don't know how what, what we're going to do in the future, but we can't go on managing ourselves. I see. And how do you see your family? And how do you appreciate your fans, the family in Turkey? It's interesting the, the the family of the idea of the kind of international brother sisterhood of fans of New Model Army exists independently of us. It's nothing to do with us. It's kind of which I like. It's good. It's no, we have you know lots of fans. Some this sort of fans sometimes become friends. Sometimes they don't. Sometimes we know them. Sometimes we don't. You know, uh, it's uh, it doesn't matter either way. What it is. It's because, I think because the songs are about something, I'm not going to say what they're about because it's all different, but there's a kind of feeling that it's about something. So it draws, New World Army draws some very interesting people together. Like Wiggins, perhaps? Well, you know, just very interesting people from different, people who like to think about ideas are drawn to New World Army because there's lots of ideas. And then they're drawn kind of because it's, they have this in common. One time we were coming to Turkey, this is some time ago, a long time ago, about seven years ago, so we played in Turkey. And there was an Irish woman who, who came to see us a lot, called Aideen. And she was on the same plane as we were. And I said, hi Aideen, um, so why, have you, why are you coming to Turkey to see, you, to see us? You've seen us hundreds of times. And she said, I'm not coming to see you, she said. I've seen you a hundred times, you're right. I'm coming to see Turkey. And I'm going to see my favourite band play in Turkey. So I'm going to meet Turkish people and it's their favourite band. So immediately I have friends in Turkey. You think uh, this forms one tribe? It's like, a, it's like a before Facebook ever existed. It's like a social network of people that are drawn together by a series of ideas around the band. It's interesting. If you wanted to go on holiday to Florida, right? Or, or France, or Paris or something. Or choose the time that you were playing. Well, or you don't have to. You can go on the New Model Army forum and say, is there anyone in Florida? Oh, sure. You know sure. what I mean? And you'll meet up with someone that loves yeah. the same band that you do, which is which will immediately give you a form kind of, of link. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'd like to take you back to your roots. Um, which other punk, folk, uh, folk and rock artists have influenced the band? Sometimes you are compared to the Clash, and uh, and sometimes I heard that you mentioned the influence of Northern Song. I'd like to learn more, more about it. Well, let's start with the fact that everybody in New Army has always liked different music. We never agreed on anything. You know, we all really, really like different things. Um, so I can talk about me personally, but that's of course not the only influence coming in. But I grew up with, I think my first love is Tamla Motown, and this kind of northern soul, black American soul music of the 60s in Detroit. Uh, I think it's the best music ever made. It's a combination of the best writers, the best singers, the best backing band, the best orchestration. But I like lots of different things. I loved The Who when I was growing up. My, my favourite rock album of all time is Quadrophenia by The Who. Because it's kind of very romantic. And it's got these big, it's a combination of violence and romance, which I kind of love. Beauty and violence. 
So what I like in art <laughs> is a combination of beauty and violence. Because um, that's kind of how nature is. Beautiful and violent. And then uh, lots of different things I love. Lots of different kinds of music. Uh, and I think we hear this eclectic uh, approach to music from your, from yeah. your sons as well. And uh, when compared to uh, perhaps this classification would be would not be right, but when compared to other punk bands that came uh, from your epoch, from your time, uh, I think your music is much more harmonic qualities, much more melody in it. Uh, I think you have to remember that punk, the word punk, became. Uh, it, it, it became a, a style of music, but in the beginning it wasn't that, it was an attitude. So we still got the attitude, we just never adopted the style of music. We feel, for, the whole thing about punk, it was a kind of um, cultural revolution. You would smash everything that's gone before, you are free to do anything. And so we take that attitude. You know, we're not interested in in what we we're what we're meant to do. We feel free to do but, anything. Uh, this question will be a bit personal, but uh, I know that your parents were Quakers, and uh, coming from an I think an active pacifist Quaker family or background, and from punk roots, yelling, "I believe in vengeance." <laughs> uh, what is your take on activism today? Oh, I'm still active every now and again. I'm, I'm still out there doing demonstrations and leaflets, and I do all that. Yeah, sure. But uh, uh, do you but, still experience problems in the USA? Do, do you oh yeah, all the same problems? things, usual sort of things. But songs are. This is there's a mistake. If people think New, New Model Army is a kind of front for pushing a philosophy like. Chumbawamba or Fugazi or Crass or Rage Against the Machine. That's wrong. We're not. We were always about freedom. Music's about emotions. It's not about philosophy. So the, the, the song like Vengeance, I think there's, there's a song on high called No Mirror, No Shadow. It says, I meant what I said at the time that I said it. Yeah? That's the kind of key lyric. So when you... I remember re writing, watching a documentary about Klaus Barbie, who was a Nazi war criminal at the time living in Argentina. Um, and I saw this program and it just made me furious. And I got a pen and I went, oh, no, no, I believe in just, I believe in vengeance. Get a fucking bastard. This is not a philosophy, it's an emotion. This is not, you know, I, I believe in, well, sometimes I believe in vengeance, I believe in forgiveness too. I think people want, they want their, they think the Mudlami is this kind of philosophy, but it's not. We've written songs like The Hunt, same kind of idea. I don't really agree with the words, but I, I remember feeling them at the time. It's about emotions. Or One of the Chosen on High, which is about the, the glory of being a fundamentalist. Fantastic, how good does it feel to feel One of the Chosen? part of something special. I am special, I am one of the chosen. And it's just about how good that feels. It's not an analysis. I remember it. When I was a kid I used to religion hop. I, used to, I, was, I was a fundamentalist Christian for like three months and then I was a fundamentalist something else for three months when I was a kid. And I remember the feeling. How good does it feel to surrender yourself to this feeling of I am special. We are right. Everybody else is wrong. Fantastic. So we so so we wrote one of the chosen, and people say this is not a critique. No, it's not a critique. It's an emotion. Uh, but I read once in your interviews that you considered New Model Army as a preacher band, but uh, you defined it as a band communicating. <laughs> yeah, you're right. Yeah. Well, we're 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 full of we're full of contradictions, but then so is life. Once you spoke highly critical of the politicians who proclaim, who proclaimed uh, you're either with us or against us. 
and I think you were this at at the time you were dissatisfied with the Blair government, Tony Blair government, and so with the Bush period. Uh, now there is a conservative government in Britain, and Obama is the president of the United States. Uh, what are your observations of Britain and USA today? Well, Britain is kind of just more of the same. I mean, Thatcher into Blair into Cameron is kind of more of the same. It's just the same. Like uh, you started in the 80s? Uh, like the time uh, yeah, started. Mrs. Thatcher. Blair was Mrs. Thatcher's natural born successor. She might, he might have in theory been on the other side, but he was, he was a Thatcherite really. Um, and he really believed in Blair. Blair believed in Blair. Uh, Cameron believes in Cameron. <laughs> They're all the same. America is an interesting thing. America is a kind of declining superpower. When I go there, it makes me quite sad, actually. Uh, Americans know that this is happening. Uh, and they're kind of a bit desperate. I find, Ameri I find America sad. And poor Obama. You know, it would have been a sort of bad election to win. You come in, you're involved in two wars which you cannot win. You've got an economy which is bust, and you've got a conservative um, backlash coming, which you, which controls so much of the media that you have no chance. He's, he's, he has no chance. In your final it. album, uh, today is a good day. Uh, you underline the economic crisis that the whole world has suffered, and. Do you think this is a sign of the change coming? A sign of the change coming, like the second coming? Do you read it as the downfall of the capitalism? Yeah, it's kind of downfall of a lot of things. It's the beginning of the end of a lot of things. Just, just on a very, very basic level. There's now six billion of us. Um, I saw the projected world population for 2040 is nine billion. You know, we're now in a world where some of the poorer parts of the world, obviously like China, uh, because everything's now made in China, there is now more resources in China, so they want to. You, can you imagine the world when every Chinese family has a car and eats meat? I mean, forget it. There is a, increasingly a kind of squeeze on resources on the earth. Everybody wants what we already have in the West have, and we can't say they can't have it. All we know is that nine billion people cannot have that lifestyle. So you think we don't live in the peaceful times? Future. Will we ever be? Future is, well, there's never been a peaceful time, actually. <laughs> In the history of mankind, we're warring monkeys, you know, that's how we are. But I think the squeeze on resources in the future means difficult time. Uh, I especially like your views on humankind, the journey of the mankind. Uh, I think here comes the world, and I love the world, reflects the suffering and the journey of all humankind. Uh, and this is, a, uh, this is caused by what I get from your lyrics is the de demise of the dogma and the technology. And uh, what do you feel about the human condition and the collective spirit of mankind today? And has anything changed? In fact, I asked this question already, but do you see anything has changed in the 30 years of the new model army? 30 years is a blink of an eye. Human beings, 150,000, 200,000 years? How long has human beings been here? 200,000 something? Blink of an eye. It's nothing. I don't... I think the world is amazing. Look at it. It's, look out there. We can, we can look, but you can't look at the camera. But out there is the, the world, right? Amazing. Just amazing. And human beings, we're amazing but we're only a tiny bit of this amazing thing. We build stuff, and then we, then we fall out and we fight each other, and then we build more stuff, and then we move to somewhere else and build more stuff and use more stuff and then fight each other. Um, and then there's more of us, and then we move somewhere else and build stuff, 
fight each other. Um, uh, we're kind of virus, really. Maybe in the end, the world will have had enough of us. The world will survive us, though. When we say, we must save the world, it's a kind of joke, yeah? The world will be fine without us. So, you think the world should be saved from us? Until we learn to live in slightly smaller numbers and, and live with it, instead of trying to control everything. We're obsessed with control. You know, we talk about, we must, the climate is changing, we must control the climate. Don't make me laugh. Control the climate? It's a joke. You know, we, are, we, are we changing the climate? Partly. It's partly a natural cycle, it's partly us. How much is, how much is which? Nobody knows, really. Can we, if we stop putting CO2 into the atmosphere and, make, and less heat, will it change back? We don't know. It's a climate. It's, you know, we're that big. The earth is old and strong. Nature is old and strong. We don't, we're a little bit of nature. The this is kind of weird arrogance and vanity of people. And this is thing why, why we had to in, why we had to invent religions, which which invent a kind of god who cares about me personally. Come on, you know it's kind of there is a god. It's nature. It's amazing. We're part of it. I think from your first album to the last album. Uh, Pneumonia Army songs reflect a different uh, view on life and death and uh, also you, uh, I think, reflected this attitude uh, from what we talked about, humanity. And uh, I think, for example, in the, I think it's a haunting song, Autumn, uh, you say everything is beautiful, just like you say, uh, because everything is dying. And also, uh, in Peace is only for, you continue your sentence with, peace is only for the dead and the dying. Uh, what I'm going to ask is, are you familiar with the uh, Sufi ideas on life and death? Yes. I think the Sufis pretty much had it right. It's interesting how, in, with, with all the great world religions, um, there is a kind of mystical part that are not so interested in the book. A fucking book. You know, these bloody books ruin everything. There are people that, that have a kind of sense that there is light and love. These are, these are you know, there's power here, which there, of course, there is. And, it, and in human experience, this is to do with light and love. And in Christianity, there are mystical sects, which are not so interested in the Bible. They're interested in the light and love. And in, in Islam it's the same thing. The Sufi thing is interested in light and love. And this is kind of the basic truth. And you know, this, there is light and there is love. The books are kind of, they don't waste of time really. Um, we know that you are uh, much more for pagan. Yeah. Well, paganism, Sufism, Quakerism, uh, all these things are kind of, you know, parts of Buddhism, they're, they're all kind of we all know the basic truth. Mm. Well, finding... Uh, but it's to do with... You know, the basic truth is to do with acceptance and surrender. Well, these are the basic uh, tenets of Sufism. Yes, yeah, surrender and acceptance. Because you are that big. And this amazing thing, in this amazing thing, you are that important. Uh, so, do you think that music is the uh, uproar of the powerless, or uh, a, a few to express music, yourself? Music is a lot of things. Music is something... Uh, it's kind of magic, isn't it? It sort of transforms things. When you're young, right, and the, and and the grown-ups tell you, they say, the world is like this. You read these books, the world is like this. And you go, your experience of the world is, it's not. It's something else. And then you hear a piece of music, abstract music, and you go, it's like that. 
this is what art is for, and out of all the art forms, music is, that's, I think, the strongest. And for many people, anyway, it's the one that's the most important in their lives. Because all these words and all these things happening and, and stuff, and all this confusion in the brain, and you want, you're looking for something which is true. And that's that, you know, this piece of music. And it's all these individual. It's interesting how it's individual. Would you like to define this truth as the poetic truth? Uh, yeah, okay. Whatever. It's not a, the thing about it is you can't define it with words. That's why we have music. Yeah? And it's really interesting about music because you can never t tell people what they should like. It's like food. You like what you like. And there's some food that you know you should eat, but you don't like it. And there's some food that you really shouldn't eat, but you like it. Same with music. There's some music that I, I know it's good, and I know why it's good, but it doesn't move me. And there's some music I know it's cheap shit made for money, but I can't help it, I love it. It's interesting. It's like this amazing abstract magic thing, and very personal to each person. I have a final question, and I know that you have changed in this 30 years of journey. Yeah, of course. And the modern army has changed, but uh, is there a song, perhaps just one song, that could define the band's outlook in life? No. <laughs> okay. So, uh, what was your pick of the songs? in the 30th year anniversary album. Ah, that would be telling. You have to wait and see. Thank you for your time. Okay, I'll tell you. <laughs> It's near enough. Uh, door. Modern time. Southwest. I think Dawn my favourite Nimad Lamy song at this moment for the last couple of years. It just has a kind of magic to it. And I like the story anyway. The story is about somebody I knew a long time ago who had a bad relationship with his wife. And they had a bad divorce and he couldn't see his children. And in the middle of the night, he got... It's a good soundtrack for this story. He got very depressed in the middle of the night and decided to kill himself. So he went upstairs, took... He had enough drugs, legal drugs, to kill himself. So he took them all. And he said, I'll walk out into the park and die. So he walked out. And then the light, the, the day began to dawn. And he was sitting by a tree and he suddenly thought, you know, the day began to dawn and he said, I don't want to die. And so he suddenly I don't want to die. And he, he, he was very kind of going, going. And he got back into his house and phoned an ambulance. They took him to hospital and he lived. And that's this, it's that story, that song is that story. Simple story, just a human story. But I just love the feeling of the music in that song. Well, I think, I think it, it, every time, I hear the end of the song, it moves me. I think uh, you have experienced a near death experience. Uh, Sorry? Uh, you had a near death experience and uh, kind of see, you have seen the light. Is that correct? Yeah, maybe. I'm, not, I'm, I'm, I'm prepared to believe that the near death experience, though, is just a super chemical in your brain. When your heart stops, there's like a super endorphin. I don't think, and you have the white light and you have the floating and it's all true, it's lovely, it's great, really. But maybe this is just a physical experience. After this, I don't know. I, don't know. I think you just, I think like, probably like Sufis believe, you just go back into the melting, into the light, and then come back with something else. I think that's probably true, but I don't know.